Hello. I was honored to be invited to speak on the language comprehension panel of the 2025 Reading League Summit in Chicago, April 22nd, 23rd, 2025. My typical focus is about integrating morphological instruction with the matrix and word sum to target the lexical layer of level of literacy. I learned a great deal shifting that focus towards how this instruction supports the super lexical frame of language comprehension. I decided to record an iteration of my talk so I can share it more widely. I've added a few words here and there and a couple of slides that I cut from the official talk just for time. The additions are just for clarity. The content is the same. With that intro, here's the question I was asked to address. More and more research points to the importance of students developing morphological awareness of decoding, encoding, and word knowledge. How can teachers specifically integrate morphology to help support language comprehension? I begin by specifying the quality of learning we want any instruction to target. Kirby and Lawson offer excellent guidance on this point. They argue, low quality learning results in knowledge that is narrow in scope, fragmented, and does not lead to other learning. Whereas, high quality learning results in knowledge that is extensive, integrative, and generative, so that it supports transfer. With this frame in mind, we begin with automaticity. Automaticity is central to anything language-related. As Cher's article on the combinatorial nature of language shows, the hard limit of cognitive processing for oral and written language means that the rapid, near-effortless access to a word's identity, its sound and meaning, is paramount. Regarding written language, he cites evidence from many languages suggesting that a reader needs to recognize somewhere between two and 3,000 words, actually morphemes, to be able to comprehend a written text. Note the centrality of morphology for comprehension here. So how do we achieve automaticity for this many morphemes slash words? Like all learning, it begins with where we direct our attention. I love Marion Wolf's statement that our attentional systems are biological spotlights. No learning can occur where our attention does not shine. As Canadian philosopher Wayne Gretzky says, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. Instruction attempts to guide the learner's attention to maximize generative learning. Of course, motivation is crucial for attention as well. The lexical quality we have for a word reflects the attention we give it in speech and print over time. If that attention binds the pronunciation, spelling, and meanings of a word sufficiently, we achieve that critical threshold of automaticity. A word with this level of lexical quality is considered a sight word. A sight word is a word for which the learner has bound the mental representations of the spelling, pronunciation, and meaning to such a high quality that seeing its printed representation affords instant access to all that information, without expending limited cognitive processing attending to substructures like graphemes, phonemes, and oral and written morphemes. Each bound sight word affords increased information and cognitive space needed for developing reading comprehension. Of course, some fail to bind sight words fast enough to keep up in literacy. Over time, the nature of our attention to oral and written words also builds a general schema for how our writing system works. That schema acts like a mental lens that directs where we do and do not shine our attentional spotlights during literacy learning. So, we should ask, how well does the typical schema for spelling match how spelling works? The vast majority of readers and writers in English would say, English spelling is an unreliable system for representing pronunciation, and that there are many irregular spellings that have to be memorized, such as these. This schema is deeply flawed, however. Take the word action. This word is not even typically taught as irregular, but consider the student who keeps misspelling it like this. Both spellings have possible graphene phonic correspondences for the pronunciation of action. How can instruction best guide attention to automate the spelling that represents the pronunciation and the meaning of this word? Many resources teach us that this word uses a TI digraph for the sh phoneme and that it has a TION suffix. Fortunately, we have tools to test this understanding. The matrix marks morphemic boundaries of morphological relatives that share a base with the same spelling and sense and meaning that we find in the banner of the matrix. 
plus signs correspond perfectly with the vertical lines of the matrix. Word sums show the morphological structure of individual words and correspond directly to that matrix. Studying morphological relatives of action with these tools demonstrates that it cannot have a TI1 suffix, as that would destroy the structure of the base spelled A-C-T. T-I-O-N does not fit in combination with other morphemes. It is not combinatorial, so T-I-O-N is not a morpheme. The matrix and word sums show us that syllables are not confined by morphemic boundaries in English. We should ask, might a habit of mentally chunking words syllabically hinder morphemic awareness? Might this be a factor for those with poor comprehension despite average or above average decoding? Such a habit of mind draws the biological spotlights to links between pronunciation and spelling, decoding, but as we see here, may hinder access to the spelling meaning correspondences from morphology. Combinatoriality also tells us that graphemes nest into morphemes. This means there is no TI digraph in action. This graphic models the nested combinatorial structure of orthography as realized in English. It shows that letters nest into graphemes, and graphemes nest into written morphemes, and written morphemes nest into written words, and then onto the superlexical. The matrix and word sums offer combinatorial guardrails for instruction because they reflect this architecture perfectly. For instance, we use them to falsify the TION suffix and TI digraph. The same tools, along with grapheme phoneme diagrams, help us see that the T grapheme can play this role when followed by the I or U. Grapheme phoneme correspondences are combinatorial too. We can only be confident about a grapheme phoneme correspondence if we see that it fits around the system also. These tools scaffold explicit instruction about the morphemic consistency inherent to English spelling despite the changing pronunciation of those morphemes. The base spelled A-C-T, with the, this sense of do perform, is pronounced act in actor, ach in action, and act in actual. If we don't teach the interrelation of morphology and phonology, we force kids to rely on rote memory. The matrix and word sums offer worked examples to scaffold explicit instruction about the interrelation of pronunciation, spelling, and meaning of English words that is central to our binding agent theory of morphology, which specifies the place of morphology in the reading triangle. We also build on Perfetti's constituent binding feature of lexical quality. This posits that increasing binding between any two corners of the reading triangle improves the overall lexical quality for a word. Morphology is the only part of the language system that can bind all three corners of the triangle, improving the overall lexical quality and thus automaticity for that word. Note that onsets, rhymes, and syllables can link spelling and pronunciation, but not to meaning. This instruction targets knowledge that is extensive, integrative, and generative. Consider this example from my own learning. Within a week of seeing my first matrix in my ninth year as a classroom teacher, I glanced at a poster on my classroom wall, and for the first time, I noticed the quest in question. I had not seen a matrix for the quest family, but the small number of matrices for other word families I had seen in a week had already expanded my biological spotlights enough that I started to notice spelling meaning correspondences everywhere. For example, a little while later, I used these tools to discover that the word emotion has a bound base M-O-T-E. That base brings the sense and meaning of move to all the words in its family. Consider the rich oral language experiences the matrix can prompt as students and teachers think about ways to use these words that reveal the underlying connected meanings. With this word, someone may offer, that was an emotional speech, it was very moving. For motive, what was the killer's motive? What moved him to do the crime? Of course, a motor is what makes a car move, but I could also say, if you really motor, you might make it on time. These tools provoke rich discussions about shades of meaning of words in any subject. Crucially, dyslexics can engage in grade-level discussions of words they could not read while drawing their biological spotlights to process concrete representations of the interrelation of the spelling, pronunciation, meanings of words at their intellectual and curiosity level. 
Here we see images for a lesson in which I was asked to study the word transition with a grade one class as part of their effort to improve transitions between activities at the beginning of the year. Students use the words action and transition in everyday language. They did not need to be able to read them independently for me to use them to teach the phonology of the T grapheme in these words. In the same way, we don't need to wait until kids can read the word cat before we use it to teach the grapheme phonic correspondence of the C or the A or the T. These students never have to unlearn the TI digraph, the TION suffix, or phrases like the T sound or the SH sound. Teaching graphing phony correspondences without reference to morphemic consistency forces us to rely on rote memory for at least some graphemes in many words. This is narrow, fragmented knowledge. It contributes to the false schema that spelling is just not understandable. For those who fail, I know of no greater cognitive load than shame. By contrast, teaching graphing phony correspondences with reference to morphemic consistency uses so-called irregular words to build an accurate schema of spelling as an ordered system that represents the interrelation of pronunciation and meaning. This is extensive, integrative, generative knowledge that supports transfer. Interventions using these tools have found empirical evidence of transfer for spelling, reading, and vocabulary. This also follows current research recommendations like those of Duke and Cartwright, Their active reading model highlights the fact that word recognition and language comprehension are interrelated from the start, and that morphology is a central bridge between the two. Not only morphology, but graphophonological semantic cognitive flexibility. That's my favorite. The matrix and word sum provide instructional scaffolding to target exactly this cognitive flexibility. For reading comprehension, the following quote sums up my argument quite well. The child learning how to read needs to learn how his or her writing system works. We should leverage the matrix and word sum to meet this goal, especially for those behind in literacy. Avoidance is a human response to the shame of not being able to read at one's intellectual level. As Marion Wolf reminds us, you can't learn where your attention doesn't shine. As I argue, nothing motivates like understanding. Thank you. Now, I'm just going to add a couple of slides here. For my handout, I included this slide that was not in my talk. I encourage you to study the way it shows how spelling represents the interrelation of meaning from morphology and etymology and pronunciation, phonology. One common practice in SWI that links to the supralexical is taking words from a study like this and planting them into sentences related to the subject area, as I'm modeling here. In SWI, I use the oval to mark any words in the same etymological family because they share aspects of meaning and spelling through a common historical root. I think of this as the extended family. Matrices are the immediate family of words that share not only a root, but also an English base. When I first shared this statement of nothing motivates like understanding with my mentor, the real spelling author, he commented, and of course you see the paradox. I had not at first, but... I did once I investigated these words and the history and structure of understand as well. See what you think. Finally, if you are interested in more along this line of inquiry, see the description of this video for a link to a 20-minute video on the universal combinatorial structure of language as it's realized in English orthography and how this structure is reflected by the word sum and matrix. You will also find a link to my talk, The Morphological Matrix Matters Because Language is Combinatorial, for the 9th Annual Dyslexia Virtual Conference with the Dyslexia Training Institute. This is the companion video I mentioned for the first video with Marie Foley. It's a 60-minute video that goes into much more detail. Thanks.